Hello, thanks for listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. This is Adam Rosen, your host. I'm a fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in joint replacement. In these episodes, I'm going to share with you a lot of my tips and tricks and review classic articles and current implant designs. Thanks for tuning in and on with the show. Hello and welcome back. This is Adam Rosen and you're listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. In today's episode, what we're going to do is talk about uh, DFRs. So for many of you, um, if you're in a regular residency program, fellowship, you may not have a huge exposure to distal femoral replacements for tumors, which is probably one of the most common areas that these implants have been used in. But what you're more commonly used to seeing is this used in the setting of a unfixable periprosthetic fracture. Um, So when you do have a periprosthetic fracture, the big question is assessing your bone stock, the stability of the implant. You know, if the implant is stable and there's sufficient bone stock, then you may make the option of doing an open reduction internal fixation with the choice uh, of the surgeon, either plate, distal condylar locking plate, potentially for an intramedullary nail if you have an open box, Uh, But for a lot of these individuals, there's been a thought and a push to doing a DFR when specifically the implant is unstable and the bone is fractured, but also sometimes in the hopes that these patients will mobilize better and quicker uh, because you're not waiting for a fracture to heal. So I am not going to go into all the specific individual steps um, that's going to be specific for the particular implant. So you have to check and see the implant company that you're using. But what I want to do is give you some, some basic tips on things to look for when you're doing a DFR. And, you know, hopefully in the book or the, you know, the stuff that you're using to study for DFRs, if you have an online resource, a way that you can jot these notes down because for many of you, this is one of those implant surgeries where you might do once in six months or once a year. And it's very easy to forget some of these tips and pearls. And if you can write them down and review them just before the case, you'll remember them, even if you don't do these frequently. So these surgeries actually, technically they're not very difficult, but at the same time, it's very easy to make mistakes that are correctable. So as far as the approach, you know, you do your regular approach and, you know, a lot of people get really scared and nervous about taking out that fractured piece. So, you know, what I find is if you can skeletonize the distal femur from front around to the collaterals and then use a large bone tenaculum by lifting up on the femur and taking off the posterior capsule um, from behind the implant and from distal working proximal by lifting up or having your assistant lift up and keeping that on tension, I believe that you're a lot less likely to get into trouble into the neurovascular bundle, but you always want to be aware of it. So that's one little trick on just getting the distal femur out. But before you do that, we want to assess a couple of things. So when you get in there, usually what you can do is assess your length. So the first thing that I'll do when I go in there is have my scrub tech build an implant. And what they'll do is they'll always start with the smallest size femur. And that's something I would strongly recommend is always use the smallest distal femur that you can get because lo and behold, and we'll talk about this a little later on, is if you try to match it to the patient's anatomy, all of these implants tend to stick out straight. So they're almost in a little bit of hyperextension. They don't have the natural curve and flexion. And what happens a lot of times is if you try to go too big with the distal femur, you wind up having difficulty closing your arthrotomy. So he'll always, or she'll always, depending on who's back there for the day, take the smallest distal femur and we'll just pot a little piece on the end of it. And then by taking the leg and pulling it into extension, I can assess the normal natural length of the limb with the collaterals while they're in there, even though the bone's still fractured and shattered. And I can make some marks and, and I can decide on the distal femur where exactly I want to make my cut. And then it allows me to kind of build what sort of buildup I need on top of the distal femur to make up for the how high up the fracture has gone. And by doing that, I've set this area. The next thing that I'll also do is identify the linea and also make a mark with the bovi directly anterior superior to the trochlea. 
And those are extremely important later on when you set your rotation because what happens is the femur is a tube. So people rush in there and they go to cut the femur off to get it out of there. And now you have an implant and the question is, where the hell do you put it? You know, there's so many degrees of freedom that you can very easily internally or externally rotate this component. So by taking the time to set your length and then also to determine your rotation before you make your cut on your femur is going to help you later on when you're implanting the actual implant. So we've set our length. And we've identified some other landmarks. Obviously, you can use the patella, meniscal remnant. If the scar is still there, you can make other marks on the capsule where the joint line is before you take the tibia out. But now we've set our rotation, and now we're going to cut our femur. So when you cut the femur, the first thing I actually do before I make the cut is put a circlage cable above that. You know, Occasionally, there's a small little fracture line you don't see or the bone's osteoporotic to begin with. So as you're cutting it, by protecting it with a circlage cable above that area, you prevent any propagation. And then once we've done that, we can then remove that femur like I discussed at the beginning. So you basically skeletonize it anteriorly along medially and laterally, big bone tenaculum, lift up, work from distal to proximal, and skeletonize it off the back of the femur, and you pull this thing out. Now, the tibia, for the most part, is pretty straightforward, but like any revision, you need to know the tibial component, and you need to know, are there spikes? Is there a flange? You know, how do you get around the back? The big thing is always trying to get around the backside and make sure, especially posterior laterally, that you clear that out so when you pull the tibia out that you don't lose a lot of bone. And occasionally, depending on the stability of your implant, you may try to get the tibia sublux forward before. I find a lot of times with these DFRs, it's a whole lot easier once the femur's out of the way because you're staring at the tibia, but you always want to protect the norovascular bundle and the posterior structures. Um, so once the tibia comes out, then you can start building and trialing. So tibia, pretty straightforward. Once you get your femur in, again, we've set our landmarks in the rotation. Um, now, when you're cementing, um, the thing that I always discuss and kind of watch out for is look at the diameter of your femur and what the lip is on the flange or the buildup of what you're using, depending on the system. Because occasionally, you know, the buildup or the implant is quite small. Um, and especially if you have a large patchless femur, there is a risk that you could cement push and you could actually push it inside the femur. So you want to make sure that you have a buildup which is going to capture itself on the actual rim of the cortical bone of the femur. One, so you get a good cement interdentation, but also so you control the length that you're looking for. Um, so now when you go ahead, normal cementing technique, you know, wash, brush, pressurize, make sure you have a cement plug, all the, the normal sort of things. But the next big points that I want to make um, are two things to really keep in mind. And in the beginning of my career, you know, I noticed um, the thing that I had the most difficulty with with these particular cases was it always seemed like these would go into hyperextension. And a lot of the companies have, you know, little bumpers, three degrees or five degrees, little bumper that you can add to the poly to prevent that hyperextension. And even with the biggest bumper, I found that all of these still wanted to drop into hyperextension. So the big mistake that I see a lot of people almost try to do is they, they want to try to jack that space open with thicker polyethylenes. And this is not a normal knee. You know, the collaterals are not there. So the problem is that if you feel that your knee is going into hyperextension, just realize it is. Um, and if you try to jack the extension gap up by adding a thicker poly, what you are in essence going to do is lengthen the leg unnecessarily, and you're going to have a leg length inequality. And then also you're going to have difficulty closing a capsule at the end. So this is where it's really important in the beginning to try to set the length and check your landmarks before you remove bone and try to build your implant and have an idea of where the length should be so you don't add more poly. But just know that most of these will hyperextend, and I always use the biggest anterior bumper that I can. And a lot of this is because, again, like I talked about in the beginning, the stems are straight and the femoral component is straight. And it tends to stick out, almost extends the distal femur from what we're used to in a normal total knee. So until some of these companies develop a slight bow or a kink or a distal femur that comes off like a three degrees flexed, you're always going to have that sense of hyperextension. So don't add poly, just add the bumper. And this allows you then to close the capsule and the capsule should close naturally and anatomically. And just know that if you're having a lot of difficulty, 
closing the capsule. And I remember one case early on in my career where just, we tried matching the femur to the size of the femur of the patient. And that, you know, after I've been told, always use the smallest, always use the smallest, that reinforced that issue of just always use the smallest. Um, it allows you the ability to close the capsule over the implant. But the next thing that I found is we all have this kind of thought like, oh, well, they can weight bear as tolerated. I'll just get these patients up and walking. And more often than not, these patients are older, they're elderly, their quads are weak to begin with. And this is a big surgery. And I found a lot of patients had difficulty getting mobilized quickly. So my standard protocol now is typically a mobilizer two weeks. And I find the immobilizer is really important in a lot of these older patients for two main reasons. One, to allow the wound to heal. You know, the wound is traumatized, it's a big surgery, and then usually these patients, if they had a fracture, it's not uncommon to be immunocompromised in some form or fashion. They may have poor nutrition, low albumin, other issues. Maybe they have risk of venothromboembolic disease, they're on a blood thinner for their heart or other reasons, so they're at greater risk of bleeding and wound complications. And I find that the knee immobilizer for two weeks allows the wound to heal. And the other thing is that they really lose a lot of the proprioception. So they lose their collaterals. They lose a lot of other proprioceptive ability. And it makes it hard for these people to get up and stand and walk and mobilize. They constantly feel like the leg wants to buckle. And by having that knee immobilizer, these patients are able to get up and stand and mobilize a whole lot easier and quicker than without the knee immobilizer. And the thing with knees is we're always concerned about stiffness. And I never see these distal femoral replacements get stiff. So having them in the knee immobilizer for two weeks, in my experience, has never led to someone at six weeks, eight weeks that has wound up with a stiff knee. Um, they all get the motion back. So that little caveat has been there. So just for summary, um, when you're doing these, obviously know your system, know your implant, know your patient, know your indications. But when we get in there, first thing is address your length. Before you take stuff out, figure out where the length is, make some landmarks, build an implant and have an idea of where your cut's going to be. Set your rotation, identify the linea, and make a mark on the distal proximal superior aspect of the femur um, so you know when you make a cut and you have a cylinder where the trochlea should line up. When you cut your femur, use a circlage cable above where you're going to cut to protect it from propagating a fracture. And then also make sure that you have a good coverage and seal with your implant when you cement based on the cortex of the femur. When you use the femur, always choose the smallest sizes. So it gives you the ability to close. Most of these will hyperextend. So use the bumper and don't chase it by adding a thicker polyethylene insert. And use a knee immobilizer. You'll find that the wounds will look better and the patients will progress a whole lot quicker. So I hope that gives you a few little tips and pearls for the next time you have a DFR on your schedule. Thanks again for listening. I'm Adam Rosen. You've been listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. You've been listening to the Total Knee Tips and Pearls podcast. Make sure that you're subscribed so you'll be notified of future episodes. And please take the time to leave a review. It helps other people like you find the show. Until next time, stay safe.